I have an apprentice named Sam. When she defends her dissertation, she'll be one of 50 practicing PhD dog behaviorists in the country. You want to do that too? You got to go to college. In this video, uh, Sam suffers from separation anxiety. In this video, I'm going to share some tips and tricks, uh, tips and tricks that will help you if you have a dog that suffers from separation anxiety. And I'm also going to go over my preferred method to help dogs who have separation anxiety, which is teaching them to stay. Now, as a dog behaviorist, uh, what I try to do when a dog uh, demonstrates that it fails doing something is to recreate that activity in the easiest version of that activity possible. Now, for a dog with separation anxiety, it's a panic attack. So if your dog chews stuff up, if you see some stuff chewed out the backgrounds from him, it's not that they're doing it intentionally, they are panic and they're freaked out and dogs chew on things to soothe and calm themselves down. Also, some dogs have accidents. It's If you had a friend who crashed, who pooped their, uh, who peed in their pants because they were so scared about something, you wouldn't make fun of them. I guess if it was a good friend, you'd probably make fun of them, but most of the time we wouldn't even say it. So for your dog, if your dog has separate anxiety and come back and the stuff is destroyed, they chewed around the molding around your door, they're trying to come and find you. If they chewed up your couch, they were stressed out. If they peed or pooped, they lost control of their bowels. The worst thing you can do is actually correct them or get upset with them. So um, uh, now there's a lot of things, and, and I talked to the guardians about when we set this appointment, that uh, we do that actually trigger the separation anxiety. It actually starts be well before you actually leave your place. Typically dogs, well, not typically, dogs learn through repetition, consistency, and good timing. You have three seconds to correct or reward the dog for them to have the ability to make a connection. So if every time you sit down here and put on shoes, and then you grab your keys, and then your glasses, and your purse, and you leave, well, the dog's like, shoes hear me, this is a beginning of the, of the uh, exodus from the house. And they start getting worked up. Yeah, oh, they did it. Oh, they went over, she grabbed her purse. Oh, and then she grabbed her keys. And by the time you actually leave, they've gotten themselves in a frenzy. So the guardians actually have done a little bit of research. They figured this part out. This is one of the parts, but it's not gonna do it completely. But you wanna desensitize the dog from all the individual various triggers. Now, one of the best ways to do this is actually have somebody in your house film you. And try to keep film like here with the dog and me in the background, in the uh, dog in the foreground, or and me in the well, me in the foreground, dog in the background. And so that way, that you can see the dog as I'm putting my shoes on here, as I'm putting my lipstick on, as I'm putting my whatever things are. And then, and you can see the dog start to breathe heavy or hold his breath. It looks like a smile to us. That's called dry panting. That's usually a pretty big sign of stress. Um, if it's pacing around, if it's licking its lips, if it's snapping its head in a different direction, if its eye, pupils are dilated, or you see a lot of white in their eyes, uh, they're holding their breath. Uh, these are all signs of stress, anxiety, yawning. Uh, so if you start seeing your dog doing those things, it's starting to get worked up. So the idea is to sit here and put your shoes on, and your dog see the pupils get big, and they, and they take your shoes off, and then walk away. And then come back and do it again. This time we'll leave our shoes on for a second or two before we take them off. Or, you know, and so we do that with each individual uh, step. You don't have to do just the shoes over and over until you're done. You can do the shoes a little bit and also work on the keys and also work on the purse and putting a jacket on. But again, if you film something, then you make a list of all the activities, the steps that you do, especially the steps the dog seems to get more and more agitated once it's completed. Then you know what you have to systematically deprogram your dog. by Picking up the key keys, put it back down. Pick up the keys, put them back down. And just keep on doing them until your dog's like, oh, whatever, man, it lays down and isn't really paying much attention. But if your dog's attention is standing, it's ready to go. It's, it's on high alert. We want the dog to be on very casual. This is another drill. Remember, he actually used to put his shoes on and leave. Now he just does it a whole bunch. So whatever all of the different individual steps are, work on all those things independently. Now, this is towards the end of the session. We just spent about two hours going on, a whole bunch of other things, delaying gratification, reward, rewarding desired actions and behaviors through passive training, petting with a purpose, enforcing rules. All these things are, uh, by itself, are not directly correlated to separation anxiety, but they are related to like, developing some, some uh, better self-control and uh, practicing doing, listening to the human, seeing the human as the authority figure and things along those lines. So this is, I have kind of a comprehensive approach uh, uh, to all sorts of dog behavior problems, including separation anxiety. Now, uh, a lot of puppy people don't realize when you bring a puppy home, uh, I mentioned this off camera, but if you bring a puppy home uh, from a breeder, the first time you put that puppy in a kennel and leave it alone is probably the first time in its life that it's ever been alone. And so a lot of dogs don't know how to process that. Dogs are extraordinarily social creatures. They're not supposed to be left alone. And so, now they can learn to tolerate it, but we have to help them practice it. And again, like I mentioned earlier, I like to practice in the easiest version possible. Now for your dog, separation anxiety is a panic attack when my humans leave and they're not next to them. 
Now, the Guardians moved from a house into a kind of a cozier place here, uh, but he still follows her around at times. And, uh, and basically, what and probably, although he could be in the other room, he probably is not going to be there too long without seeing them. So what I do is I teach the dog to stay, and then I can help the dog practice staying, put him in a stay, and then go to use the bathroom. Put in a stay, then go back and change clothes. Put in a stay, go get a drink of water. So the idea is to formulate it so each stay is a little bit longer, a little bit longer. At first, we're helping the dog stay apart from us while we're in the same room, it can still see us. Then eventually, it stays while we're in the next room, it can't see us, but it knows that we're in the apartment. The next thing is when it stays when we're outside the door, maybe with the door open, so it sees us right there. And then eventually we're walking down the steps with the door open. And after we do this enough, then we can, maybe we can close the door. There's a lot of different variations that we can do. But the idea is to make it very progressive so each time is only slightly longer than the step before. And if your dog panics when you go to the next step and freaks out or has a setback of some sort, that means you need to back up one step and practice the previous step. Now, I asked the guardian how she taught the dog to stay. She said uh, she knows how to stay. He knows how to stay. But she, she really was describing more of a wait command. A uh, wait means wait until you hear the next command. It could be any command. Come, sit, lay down, roll over. Stay means stay until you hear the release word and only the release word. Now, before I start doing this, uh, I forgot to ask this cam uh, off camera, what would you like the release word to be? It should never be the word okay. I have four dogs. I say break, release, parole, and freedom. Parole, I like is a funny one. Uh, but coming up with funny command words can help. It doesn't have to. You can say blue or X and have that mean to be released. But I like to say holiday, vacation, PTO, something along those lines. Sometimes make it a little bit easier. Do any of those release? Release. Okay. So basically, and you have have you been saying release? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Specifically, letting him eat. Like that's his okay to eat. Okay. Or when we do stay. So release should be release for stay and only that one capacity. So here's the release for other things I would come up with break or freedom or parole or vacation. Do you have any of those others that you like? Parole is funny. Okay, so we'll do parole. Now, he just laid down. A lot of dogs don't like, uh, prefer laying down. So if you're, the book says all the dog has to do is stay in the location, not necessarily sitting or standing. I do this professionally, so if I might have, if I want my dog to stay, in a sit, I put in a sit and I should stay in a sit. But when you're first teaching your dog, whatever your dog's position is that's comfortable with. So if your dog keeps on going into a down position, just start off in a down. If it prefers sitting, just go with whatever's easiest. Stay is hard. A lot of people think, you know, the first, I teach the stay for three days, I should explain. First for duration. I'm gonna practice until he can stay here for up to five minutes. Mm -hmm. There's no distance. That's the next step, that makes it harder. Now for a lot of people, like the dog just sits there, it's, that's not hard. It is hard. Most dogs will start offering you different things. I mean, why are you not giving me the treats? I can smell you have a lot of treats. Why? I'm sitting, I'm pawing, I'm doing all this other stuff. Just sitting there doing nothing is more difficult than, the, than we actually give dogs credit for, or than we realize for dogs. So, uh, and also this is a domination move, so this is why I'm not a fan of teaching dogs to shake, uh, at least initially. So basically, first, once the dog can stay up for, for five minutes, that's when I'm going to start going to distance, which is the second D. Then once the dog can be, out, uh, can be out of sight for longer than five minutes, then only then do I do distractions, the third game. So I'm gonna show you how to do duration and distance, I'll describe distractions. All right, so first of all, let's go ahead and get you over here, buddy. So I'm gonna face me. So I have treats in my hand, I'm gonna hold it between my thumb and forefinger so I can deliver the treat really quickly. The timing of, and the delivery of your treat is really important to how uh, intense the reaction is for the dog. So I'm gonna hold it here in my hip, and I'm holding it with my thumb and forefinger so I can actually pop it in his mouth when I want to. There we go. So he will stay with the down, that's fine. So when I say stay, when I get the halfway point between me and him, then I pull my hand back, put it in my chest, and I count to five. Whatever number you're going to start at. Stay. So always say the command word after the treat goes in the mouth, not just for stay, for any command. Now I'm going to go to 10 seconds. Stay. Stay. Oops, let's try that again. Stay. If you want to create a hand signal as I deliver the treat, I give it as well. Um, so that's 10 seconds. If you notice, I started looking around. If you constantly keep eye contact, as soon as you break eye contact, your dog will break the stay. So you want to practice, and eventually we're going to have some stay in the other room. He won't be able to see us anyways. So let's do 15 seconds now. Stay. Did you 
paint your place. It was already painted this way. So talking and kind of doing other things is, and I have my dog stay when I'm making you know, some food or getting a glass of water. It's a great way to practice because it's not that hard for him to do it for a little bit. All right, stay. Now we're done and I want to give him the, uh, the, uh, the <coughs> that means that we're done. So we're going to say the P word. Okay, so now I'm going to do this like that. Parole. Now, the guardian had already been practicing with this, and I could tell that you used that release word, and you have practiced this because he was hesitant to go in. If you notice he licked his lips a little bit, that's a sign of stress or a, a little anxiety. So that's why this is a different command. So instead of saying stay, you might want to come up with a word like freeze or hold, even though that really, your stay is really going to be more of a wait. But this way we take away the baggage from that, and so he doesn't get confused, because I think that's what it was. He was a little confused. All right, so whatever iteration. Now, I, my puppy, my most recent puppy, I had to spend a week doing one second stays. And as soon as I went to two seconds, he would get up and move away. So always count your head. So if you go from like, uh, let's say you're, I was going by uh, tens, let's say I go to 20s, and I go 20, 40, and at 38, he gets up and walks away. Well, then I need to know where we're at, so next time I practice maybe 35. So always back, back up a step. And don't worry, there's going to be ebbs and flows just like anything else in life. There'll be days where you do really well, days where you don't do as well. I can't sit and kneel like that for too long. My uh, legs go to sleep. Um, so, crash, passive training. So basically, uh, for the stay is one of the few exercises where I actually tell people it's okay to stay for longer than five, uh, longer than 90 seconds. Usually for training, I tell people to keep it 90 seconds or less. But eventually we're gonna get to the point where you do one minute stay. So stay, you're waiting a minute. And then stay two minutes. Well, now you're past the 90 seconds, that's okay. But get there progressively. Don't take too big of a jump. That's the biggest mistake people make. When you're teaching them to stay, it has to have a 100% success rate for the practice. Otherwise, it's practicing what we call an auto-release. It releases itself. Now, the next stage that I want to do, and we might, if, if you can't see my head, that's okay. Just keep, make sure the dog's in the shot. So what I'm going to do is the same sort of thing. And so again, if he prefers to be in a down position, that's okay. And when I do this, I usually like to have the number of treats that I'm going to do in my hand plus an extra two. So if there's one that we need to throw it to redirect it, we have an extra spare. And we always, but if I have to reach back here and get in my pocket, that takes time. And all, all it takes is one second for your dog to be like, oh, he looks like he's shocked and gets up and walks away. Then it practices an auto release. Remember, it has to be at 100% stay. So stay, and then I take one step back, or let's say, we'll say hold. So let's do that again. Hold. And I, I took one step back, I'm going to count to two. One, two. Come back. Hold. Hold. One, two. Up. Now I count to four. Hold. That was a little bit early. I should wait until it went in his mouth. Now you saw there, he started to get up. And because uh, I started moving away. Staying, that's why we want to achieve the five minute benchmark before we start moving any distance. Don't do it because you'll have not a firm foundation and then your dog won't have a good stay. And that's one of the most common mistakes people do when they're teaching them to stay. Now, when I start moving away, I want to keep doing just one step away, two steps away like I was doing there. Get to the point where you're at least 15 steps away before you start moving out of line of sight. Now, I'm a pantomime right now. Oh, that's right. Parole. So you did a pretty good job with him. Most of my clients have done a, not a very good job with the stay, so kudos. Uh, all right, so now let's say that the wall is right, let's say there's a wall right here. And so I'm walking down the hallway and the dog is, let's say the camera is where the dog is. I go hold, I take my steps back and I work my way up to the point where I'm 15 or more feet away. The wall is right here, like a right angle. Oh, here we'll do this. Let's imagine that this is a wall. So you can't see once I'm, so what I do is, when I get to 15 or more paces, I take one step here, you can't see me. Then I come back, walk back to the dog, and give him a treat and say hold. Next step, I walk back 15 steps again. This time I step out of the way for two seconds. And then walk back to the dog and give him a treat. And again, after every how many, three, five, ten, how many times you're gonna do it, always throw a treat off to the side, parole. So he knows that that means we're done. So the idea is when we move out of line of sight, that's really hard for dogs. Now, in this place, he's probably a little bit more comfortable because he's gotten used to living here and you're, it's a small, cozy quarters. But now I want to do it. I could like not eat Burger King all day long. But when I'm on a diet and I see those commercials on TV, 
I think that Burger King looks pretty good. I normally wouldn't eat it. But because it's not available, suddenly now it's more appealing. Same sort of thing for him. If I have to stay here, now I really want to come and find you. So the idea is to help him practice. Now, what I want the dog to do is I want the dog to practice being calm when it's alone. Most people have the dog practice being alone, but it's freaking out the whole time, chewing, barking, going, drooling. Well, that's what it's practicing, panicking while it's being alone. So this way, when we give it a, uh, have a dog a stay where it's doing a job, so that helps it be a little bit more comfortable and confident. Uh, and or in the moment because it's I, I can't I can't chase the cat right now I'm staying. So the idea is we eventually prolong it into the point where you can have him in the other room or you're in he's in here and you're in the other room and he's in there for a little, whatever the period of time is. Now I usually recommend people go to like 15 minute uh, go to about 15 minutes before they start trying the next step, which would be to leave. Now when you leave again, what I would do is incorporate part of the departure. I would pop your door open, we're in an apartment complex, but we don't have the public realm outside, it's still somewhat private. So I'd open your door, and here's a door jam so it stays, put him in a stay in that room over there, then walk backwards, and when you're still moving on the last side, you move one step down the stairs. And then come back, and then give, after one second, give him a treat, and walk all the way back there, and then two steps down the stairs. Eventually go to the point where you're going all the way down the stairs, and I would use your security camera so you can see, did he get up? If he doesn't, now you're practicing the whole recreation of you actually leaving the building, but the door's open, so it's different. Well, they're not, I'm not restrained, I can go find her if I need to. It's kind of how the dog makes it, we make it easier for the dog. And eventually it gets to the point where you can actually open the door and practice going outside. Probably not tomorrow, the next day it's supposed to be really cold. But the idea is progressively longer, longer periods of time in different parts of the, uh, in different areas, don't always practice in the same spot. But eventually we get to the point where we're actually leaving the place and the door is open. So he doesn't have that feeling of confinement, but he's still not coming to get you because he's still doing his job. And then you basically start elongating it. Now, I usually don't practice the stay once I close the door. What I want to do is just put the dog, you know, just have the dog nice and exercise properly so he feels good and confident. And then I get up and I leave the house and I go outside and I wait one second and I come back inside. I'm not telling the dog to stay at this point. We use the stay to practice being alone, being calm. Now, we want to use that confidence, but not the skill set. So now we just leave the door, close the door, and as soon as it closes, I turn around and open it and come right back in and sit down and don't say a word. Watch a little TV, wait a minute or two, and then practice that again. And this time when you leave, you know, again, you can watch it in your security camera. This is healthy, you can watch it this time. Um, but you're watching to see, does he freak out? And what you should see, because you're doing this independent of all the individual triggers that make him think that you're leaving for a long time, and you practice with the door open, you practice with the stay in the other room. So he's used to staying by himself and being calm. Now again, when we leave and we close the door, we don't tell him to stay. We just basically go out and we watch and we evaluate. Now don't wait for him to panic. The first time, what we want is build success. So first time you go out the door, close it, and then turn around and come back in and sit down and, and just ignore. If he's panting or breathing, remember don't pet him when he's worked up. And then if, if you do, just tell him to sit and then pet him. Um, and then next time you practice a little bit longer and a little bit longer. But the idea is instead of saying, okay, well, we've gotten up to about 15 minutes, how about we just go grab a quick bite to eat and we'll come back? Well, maybe he only can make it for 14 minutes and once 15 minutes, now he starts practicing panicking. So the whole point when we're doing this is maybe just go sit in your car on the street and watch with your Wi-Fi. So if he does panic, you know what the counter is and just start a, and do a stopwatch on your phone so you know exactly where it's at. And then you would back up, let's say we get to 17 minutes, and 7 minutes and 1 second, he got up and he started panting and drooling. Okay, then let's back up to 16 minutes and 45 seconds. Let's practice that one a couple more times, build up more confidence, then we'll go back to the 7 minute mark. So it's going to be an ebb and flow as you're going, but eventually the dog practices being calm and alone. Also, we develop all these other skills um, through petting with a purpose and passive training and all the rest of that stuff to build his self-esteem and confidence. Now his confidence is actually, you know, is a lot higher than most of the dogs I'm working with with separation anxiety. So I think for part of it is the situation at least is uh, uh, the exercise. I think the exercise has been a contributing factor. By itself it's not, uh, but all these things kind of add up. Now, crash. Uh, right now the guardian's doing a great thing. She's taking a dog daycare instead of leaving home. So he's not practicing that unwanted behavior. Unfortunately daycare is not super cheap and so you know there's only so much money we have. But this is a great thing to have to take the dog to daycare so he doesn't practice. A lot of people try to do this exercise, and then they also leave the dog at home. So it practices panicking and it practices, it just really slows down your progress. So practice this as much as you can. And if you take him out and about with you, go to a pet store or something like that, tell him to stay there. That's a great way to practice with distractions because there's only sights and sounds and smells. 
A lot of people go to the dog park and they're pissed because there's no dogs there because it's brutally cold. Well, stay there as long as you can. And it's a great time to practice your stay because it smells like the urine from all these other dogs and pee and there's tennis balls and there's all this stuff and I'm staying here not doing anything. Again, we're building up that skill set, which will help in other ways as well. But right now we're just using this stay and teach him not to panic when we're left home alone. Uh, all right, well, uh, I think that's just about it, buddy. Do you have anything else you want to say? It's like, I want more treats. Well, <laughs> this is Sam, and these are tips and tricks on how to teach your dog to stay, as well as tips to help uh, eliminate or desensitize your dog from the triggers of separation anxiety.